pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. A um, couple of uh, weeks ago, I was looking at a topic that I titled The Fruit of the Spirit. The Fruit of the Spirit. And we looked at it and emphasized that it is the key ingredient that God wants all of us as his children to have because it is the key and the secret to healthy relationships with God as well as with one another. And then I started to look at the different attributes of that fruit of the Spirit. I mentioned that it is not fruits, plural, but fruit, singular. What it has is like a fruit that has myriad or multiple flavors, more or less. And all the different attributes of that fruit, God expects us to have them and growing in them. And indeed, if we can grow in those attributes of the fruits of the Spirit, all nine of them, it's almost like saying if we can taste all the flavors of that particular fruit of the Spirit, then and only then can we truly understand what God has created us for. To form and to build a relationship with himself and with one another. And if in any relationship, friendships or whatever form of relationship, we can continue to grow and add those fruits, you know, the attributes of that fruit into our lives, we will be improving them day by day. So we looked at love to start with, which is like the umbrella, the foundation that holds all of them together. For those who are hearing us for the first time, if it's possible for you to look on the archives, you can go there and listen to that. Then we looked at joy. Incidentally, we have two joys in our midst here today. And we looked at that attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, joy. We also looked at peace. Today we're going to look at another one in this Bible study, which means we can all participate in this. We can read and we can comment when it is requested of us. We're going to look at one that is called long suffering. Long suffering. <clears throat> it is rendered in some translations as what? Patience. In some translations, quite a number of translations, it is rendered as patience. And in modern English, that's probably what we understand. When you use the word long suffering, it might not be something that would be easily understandable for us, but from the way it is used, suffers long. We know the Bible says in the classic uh, chapter of love, love suffers long. Who loves suffering here? Nobody loves suffering. So why will long suffering or suffers long be a part of the fruit of the Spirit? So that's what we're going to look at. The, again, to remind us, the fruit of the Spirit is in Galatians chapter 5. So let's open Galatians chapter 5. This time anyone who opens can read. Fastest finger. If we see, if you have plenty of fast fingers, then maybe we'll start reading in sequence. Okay, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Who sees read? Bobby. Okay. Gentleness and self-control, against such there is no law. Now, these things Twenty-two and twenty-three. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Okay, it says forbearance there. In the King James and the New King James, what does it have? Long suffering. That's where it's coming from. Okay. If you have followed from the beginning, you will recognize that the fruit of the spirit in simply telling us to develop the ability to react like Jesus Christ, to do things and to respond to what life throws at us the way Christ will, both to people and to circumstances. Pure and simple, that's actually what the fruit of the Spirit is telling us. For example, love. Love is simply a reaction to people who are disagreeable. The way Christ will react to people who are disagreeable, you react to them with love. Joy is reacting to depression in a way that Christ will react to it. Things that normally will weather our spirit, that will force us to be melancholic, that will force us to be sad and depressed, will react to it the way Christ will react to it with joy. 
peace is to react the way Christ will react to things that are distressing, anxieties, and things that are painful. To so have this inner calm that no matter what is happening around and to us, we can have this inner peace. So it's really talking about Christ's response to various things. And this one we're going to look at today, patience or long suffering, is simply the way Jesus Christ responds to very difficult situations. And I think it's one thing that as human beings we need in spades, okay? Sometimes we think of patience as being our ability to just wait, okay? To wait, to be able to delay reacting. But really, in the Bible, that's not entirely just how it is. It's not bad to wait. It's even good to wait. In fact, there are people who tell you learn to practice the art of the pause. I will find out waiting is all part of patience. But patience does more than that, okay? Oftentimes, our society is a society that's in a hurry. Young kids are in a hurry to engage in things that are for adults. Young men and young women are in a hurry to quickly reach some goals. Everybody is in a hurry to achieve things. <clears throat> and that's one of the problems that we have in our society. And frankly, in our spiritual life, it's also a great enemy. There is a man called Carl Jung. He wrote a book. And in one of the, in the, one of the statements he wrote in that book, he said, hurrying or being in haste is not of the devil. He said, hurry is the devil itself. If you sit and look at a lot of things, you recognize that actually has some truth, okay? So, um, I want us to look at how the Bible in the New Testament uses the word patience. As you can see in some translations, it has long-suffering. It has forbearance, okay? And it is a powerful ability and capacity to endure under difficult circumstances, as well as to endure and to interact and deal with difficult people without losing your cool. That's patience. You will find out that this ability affects how we relate with man, and it affects how we relate with God. There are some people who are just disagreeable. The very way they relate, the very way they talk, their mannerism almost makes you want to remove their head. If you can interact with people like that and your blood is not boiling, your pressure is not rising, you don't feel irritation around people like that, that is an aspect of patience. If you are, are having things happening around you that is difficult, that is hard, you want something and you are not getting it, or there is there seems to be a hindrance, an obstacle ahead of you in achieving something. Or there is an adverse condition where you find yourself and it seems not to be ending. And you don't get depressed. And you don't blame God and feel angry and feel upset with God. That's also an aspect of patience. There are two words used in the New Testament to define patience. Incidentally, I don't know how many of you have been visiting uh, there is a website that I played some materials from so one time, and one of our brothers in Abuja actually created a group where it shares a number of materials, some video clips from that website, bible.org. Okay? There is one clip on it that talks about the attributes of God in Exodus 34 verse 6. Let's see Exodus 34. Exodus. 34, as our first scripture, verse 6. Who's going to read first? If you've seen it, raise up your hand, please. If you've seen it, just raise up your hand. Yes. Wally. Verse 6. Yes, please. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord. Hold on. So this is God describing himself, okay? Trying to, it's like saying, who are you? Asking, who are you? And then you describe yourself. This is God describing himself. Continue, please. The Lord. The Lord God, merciful. And merciful gracious, and gracious. Long suffering. Pause. You notice one of the words that God used to describe himself, part of his nature, part of his character, is long suffering. Okay? 
Continue. I'm abounding in goodness and truth. Okay, thank you. In that video, I don't know how many of you have seen it, they looked at the meaning of those individual attributes. Long suffering. In the Hebrew, the word actually simply means somebody who is long of nose. Somebody who has a long nose. Because in Hebrew, when they describe somebody who is angry, somebody who quickly, the word is also used for born hot. When it says, and the anger of the Lord, born hot. Okay? It's, defi it's defining somebody who is also quickly getting angry. But the opposite of this is that long of nose. So in Hebrew, when they want to talk of somebody who is angry, they say the, the nose is red. It's only white skinned people, maybe Oibo people. You can see when people, when somebody's angry, the nose immediately becomes red. And oftentimes in cartoons, they describe or they portray an angry person as bringing out smoke from the nose and sometimes maybe from the ears. And actually this and this becomes red. So the Hebrews use the word long of nose, more or less, to describe somebody who is long suffering. So it's like saying, God has a long nose. But we know God doesn't have a long nose. His nose takes time before it gets hot. It doesn't get angry quickly. It doesn't lose its temper quickly. Is somebody put up the ace in this room? Okay. We need more. It's hot, isn't it? So, um, that attribute is describing someone who under provocation or under extreme situations and circumstances or under provocation from individuals or people, the person's nose does not quickly get hot. The person doesn't quickly become angry. Long suffering. That's a word used in the Hebrew language. Now for Greek, where the New Testament is written, that we're looking at long suffering under the fruits of the Spirit, the word are two that are used. And they use two words to describe long suffering or forbearance. And the words, the first one, hupomon. That word hupomon simply means to be abiding under. It's like you have a heavy weight on your head and you can stand and the weight is not pushing you down and you can stay and abide and maintain your level under that heavy weight. That is one of the words used for long suffering. More or less, it's like somebody who can suffer and endure it for long. Okay? That is the word. Somebody who is undergoing difficult situation and the person is not despondent, is not, is not losing faith, is not losing hope, the person is not losing their hope, they don't become temperamental, and their disposition, their nature is not going down. Hopomon, that is somebody who can abide under a heavy burden. The second one is macro to most, which is long anger. That is someone whose anger takes time to build. It's not someone who is like this, quick anger, quick anger. But someone, you do something, or there's a, you know, you do something to, to upset them, to offend them, and they can stay their cool, they can maintain their cool for a long period. Incidentally, those two words reflect how we relate both to God and to man, isn't it? See, when we are going through difficult situations, it's God we seek, we seek. Even if we are going and looking to individuals to help us, but situations oftentimes is God we are seeking to help us out of some difficult conditions or suffering. Somebody can't can pay house rent. Somebody is unable to stretch their salaries or they can't get a job or they can't get to admi admission and stuff like that. We keep praying and we keep praying. If someone can abide under such difficult conditions that is out of their hands, really, that is in the hands of God, and yet, they are still hopeful. Their faith, their trust, their ability to be friendly, to be nice, to be gentle, to be outgoing to other people around them is not affected. Then they have that attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, long-suffering, hukumon. However, also, someone who has people around them who keep doing things, they're stepping on their toes, irritating them, arrogance, insolence, the way they're behaving and interacting with them in whatever form, and they can still maintain their anger. Their anger does not burn quickly or their nose don't get hot very quickly. More like say they have a long macro tumors. So in effect, the spirit of patience 
that the Holy, the Holy Spirit gives as a part of the fruits of the Spirit and, uh, uh, um, empowers us to be able to bear under difficult situations so that our hope and faith in God is not lost. And the same way it allows us to bear with one another so that we do not quickly get angry with one another. Okay? So, knowing what, you know, patience is and how it's used in the scriptures, perhaps if we understand that anger is a, an integral part of patience, maybe if we look at anger and how we can control anger and how that spirit of patience can help us, we'll understand more these attributes of the fruit of the spirit. Okay? So, I want to look at anger to start with because almost the spirit of patience helps us to not become angry with God or to become angry with man, so to say. It helps us to bear on that difficult situation so we don't lose our cool with God, neither do we quickly lose our cool with man. So, we look at what anger is to start with. Okay? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Who has it? Who's seen it? Show of hands. Ephesians 4, 26. Because in looking at patience, some might be thinking anger itself is bad. No, anger is not bad. Yes, please, destiny. See, smart boy. You saw it by our I like smart people. Continue. Angry. Don't, don't, I do not do not let the sun go, go down on your right. Okay, so you see, being angry or anger itself is not sinful. The scripture shows many times that God was angry. Many times the Bible says God was angry. If anger is sinful, it will not be applied to God at all. Okay? But the scripture says be angry. But it says we should not sin. This is actually saying that we need to have a control on our anger. Remember that somebody who is undergoing a heavy body, does the person not feel the weight of the body? Are there no situations, circumstances that could make us angry? If I were a student using something we can relate to it, and Asu is on strike, I went through such, 17 month strike, 9 month strike, 6 month strike, in 4 year, actually I took, 4 year program became a 6 year program, okay? So if I were a student and Asu is on strike, for every month and every day, does it mean one will not feel anger? And then you keep seeing how they are spending money on this, spending money on election, you know, termites eating some things, snakes swallowing money, you know, monkeys carrying money away and all those kind of things. One will feel anger. But if we can control that anger such that it does not take away our joy, our peace, our confidence, our ability to interact with one another, does not make us short-tempered, does not make us Despondent, we cannot associate with people, we draw, we withdraw into ourselves, and anybody bumps into us, we're quickly angry, then we are actually exhibiting patience. So it's not as if the anger cannot be there. But well, how we deal with it and how we respond to it and how it affects us, it was determined whether we have that with us. Incidentally, the English word anger came from the English word to choke. To choke, when you put your hand on somebody's neck and you're choking. And sometimes when you're angry with someone, is that not what you feel like doing? You want to just choke the person out. The scriptures tells us anger causes problems in our systems. Biology shows us, proving, I'm not going to all of that, that anger releases what is called adrenaline into our body, it's a hormone. The more that stays in our body, the more frequent it comes in our body, begins to cause a lot of problems in our lives. Physical problems. You've seen, sometimes people think it's only people who are big and obese that have high blood pressure. People who are slim can have high blood pressure. Why is it that people who worry because of some problems in their lives, or people who used to get angry very quickly and are constantly always angry used to have high blood pressure as well. High blood pressure is the least of the problems caused by anger in our body. So it actually makes sense if as human beings we recognize the danger anger can cause in our physical lives and work to actually remove it so that we develop this ability that is called patience. Let me 
read something to you. This is from various studies, okay? Our lancets and many medical problems. The many studies have shown that consistently angry people, people who are constantly angry, either you are seeing someone and you're angry, either something you are looking at the situation you're in and you're angry and the feeling is just there, and you have not learned to control and contain and keep that anger down. It says they are vulnerable to physical problems like ulcers. If you don't know, anger and constant anger, constantly getting angry, can give rise to ulcer, high blood pressure, heart attack, strokes, colitis, arthritis, kidney stones, gallbladder. In fact, over 50 major illnesses they are caused by anger. Over 50 of them. Sometimes psychologists will say if you swallow it, like something is, see the anger is there and you are not relieving it or dealing with it and you keep it inside and it's festering, your stomach will remember. And as your stomach remembers, it begins to create various problems in our body. Anger will often take away real normal response and will behave in a way that is abnormal. That's why under anger, some people have killed. Some people will say words they do not need to say and they should not say. Proverbs 11, verse 29. Proverbs 11, 29. Troubles his own house, we inherit the wind, and the fool will be servant to the wife of the house. Okay, see, the one who troubles his own house provokes his own house. The living Bible tra tra paraphrase says, The fool who provokes his family to anger and resentment will finally have nothing worthwhile left. If we recognize that anger is costly. And it can take away a lot of things from us, not just the people we love, but our very health. Then it makes sense for us to walk to develop patience, to walk to be very slow to get angry, to walk to be steady under difficult situations, to learn to suffer long, more or less, okay? So the first thing is to recognize that anger is costly, and we need to find a way to deal with it. The, the way to do that is to develop and ask God to give us this habit and to keep working and looking to God to develop the habit or the, the attribute of patience. One other way that we can actually re handle anger is to learn to reflect before we react. When things happen, practice what I call the art of the pause. I said earlier, patience is more than just waiting, okay? Waiting is good, but it's more than just waiting. And the waiting part of it is you just, just wait, but you're actually thinking and reflecting along those lines. Look at James chapter 1. Um, before you read James, Proverbs 16.32 is probably the first place to read. Proverbs 16.32, who has seen it? Yes, Bobby. That I Better a patient person than a warrior. Someone that is slow to anger, that is also long suffering. You see, anytime they use the word slow to anger, it's talking about relationship to man. When they use the word long suffering, it more or less reflects the situation you can control and relates to actually God, even though that can also affect man as well. If you are slow to anger, it says you are better than a warrior. And he that rules his spirit than he who can who takes a city. Now James 1 from verse 19 to 20. Who's going to read? Show of hands if you've seen it. Destiny. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be Let every man be swift to hear. Most times when things happen, we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear. But he said we should be eager. That's what it means, swift, be eager, be quick to want to hear. Mm -hmm. slow, to speak. slow to speak. Slow to wrath. And slow to wrath. That is very slow to get angry. 
Somebody once said that, and my dad repeated this to me years ago when he was alive. He said, when you are angry, do not talk. If you must talk, count to 10. When you are very, very angry, count to 100. <laughs> Before you reach that 100, that anger will, will calm down. It makes sense. That's one of the ways we can deal with anger. And sometimes the problem with people who, are, who have anger problems is that, it's a, it, I, I don't know, but some people, it's a sense of, you know, I can't take this, you know? I, I must respond to this. My rights has been trampled upon, or something like that. If you look at that uh, word that he used there, he said, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to write. The word they use there is that macrotumus, which means long anger. Let, let your anger take time before you get there. And the easiest way to do that is simply for you to have patience and reflect, be thinking, be thinking, be thinking. Proverbs 29, verse 11. Yes, please, precious. A fool vents, an idiot, somebody not wise at all. They will just say everything that comes to their mind. Say, I want to express myself. They, they will just say it out. Everything that comes to their mind, to their head, they just pour it out. Scripture says that's a fool. A fool or a stupid man will give free rein to his anger, according to the Living Bible. But a wise man waits and lets it grow cool. See, to let it grow cool, it's not, see, sometimes when there is a situation that makes us angry, or somebody does something that makes us angry, patience is not, okay, you know, you see, that is not waiting, no. What I'm going to do. Hey, um, <laughs> see, when you are actually delaying, you are actually doing something better, something to, to, to take away the anger. You are reflecting. And the question to be asking, if you are not counting, is to be asking that, why am I angry? What exactly is making me angry? Should I be angry? And if I should be angry, should I be this angry? And if I am this angry, why can I, what can I do to take this anger away. You are reflecting. You are not just looking at what is I'm making you angry, what is making you upset. You are thinking about what you should do and how you should do. One psychologist said that anger is always the second emotion in any situation. Always. The second emotion. If you can think about the first, if you can allow yourself to think about what the first is, by the time you understand and you realize what the first emotion is, your anger will have cooled down a bit. Then by the time you ask the question, should I actually be this angry? Or should I be angry? You might find the anger cooling. Someone did something some time ago. And I was so instantly, you know, sometimes anger comes without, you don't, you don't decide to be angry, right? It just comes. And I was so angry. I was so angry, my first instinct was to do something that was going to cause a lot of hazards. You just people. And the kids people, my dad and my mom. When their blood meets, hey, I bet most of you haven't seen me really angry. It's a terrible thing, it's a terrible weakness. And for the first time, I was like, okay, let the whole house burn down. <laughs> And then the moment that entered my head, so this is actually a habit each of us can develop. And I said to myself, so why am I angry? What is the, what is the reason why I'm angry? And I recognized it was simply I felt my ego was insulted. I felt I was insulted and I was belittled. And my pride was hot. And then I said, okay, should I be angry that my ego was hot? Should I be upset that my pride was hot? 
And one of the things I've always, always tried to remember is the scripture says that God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And anything that has to do with self, me, and how I feel, somebody upset me, and the thing they do to upset me is not a principle. It's not about principle, it's about me being hot. I feel, excuse me, for my level, for my status, for who I am. Somebody did this to me, I must respond back. The moment I started thinking of why I was not angry, I felt embarrassed. And the thing I was even thinking in my head disappeared. So sometimes you don't give vent to what is in you. But that ability doesn't come naturally. It's a gift. That's what the scripture says. It's a gift from God. And we must desire it. And we must, we must want it. And the scripture says, ask, seek, and knock. So if I recognize that I don't have these macro tumors, I don't have this slow to anger, I don't have this humano, I don't have this long suffering ability, ability to endure long, to abide long on that suffering. I don't have this long nose of sorts, where any little thing like this, my nose burns hot, I get very angry. Then I need to ask God to help me. And I've mentioned at least two ways we can begin to develop that ability that God can help us. And the first one I said is to recognize that anger is costly. It costs us physically. Our bodies are chemical bodies. We are made of chemical beings. When you are angry, when you are, when you are sad, you know, the scripture says a merry heart does good like medicine. And it says bitterness will eat to the marrow of the bones like a canker worm, like a cancer. So we have recognize that anger is costly. And to hold it and it will allow it to be in me can cost me my health. Then we will be better off to learn to endure and dissipate that anger so that it does not hold us down. And the second thing I mentioned is that we must learn to reflect before we react. Think before you act. The thing happens and you feel like responding. Pause. I used to tell my friends when there is a discussion. I love a good discussion. And if there is a situation happening that is not ideal, and you see, and I'm still talking, and I'm still explaining, oh, I'm not that angry yet. As my anger gets to increase, you see me get more and more quiet. I will say less. When the anger has reached where it's like, it's about to boil, I'll just go zip, I'll say nothing again. At that point, I'm thinking, I'm trying to find a way to diffuse whatever it is I'm thinking. If it's somebody that I value, I'm beginning to look at the reason I value them. And why it's important for me to not act or talk or do something. And I begin to understand, try to look and dissect why I'm angry. Should I be this angry? You know, do I really have a right to be? Or is there any point in being angry? Or can I sit? And so, point is this. Learn to reflect. Number three. One way you can deal with anger. Learn to release your anger appropriately, okay? Learn to, re to, re to release your anger appropriately. Earlier, I asked us to read Ephesians 4.26, okay? Which says, be angry but do not sin. In the Good News translation, it says that if you become angry, so don't let your anger lead you to sin. See, patient, being patient does not mean you deny your anger. Being patient does not mean you never get angry. It does not mean when somebody does something or a situation there that is making you angry, you refuse to stay angry or somehow you deny the fact that you are angry. No, that's not what it means. Okay? Psychologists even tell us that one of the ways you can release anger is to find a way to release it. They will go somewhere and people will scream. They say, scream, scream it out, scream out, say all the things you want to say. You are releasing the anger from inside you. That those who feel the best thing to do is to go out and do something in excess that will take out the anger. It's not, it doesn't work. We have an unlimited supply of anger inside us. And I believe the only way we can appropriately release our anger is to put it before God. If you haven't gotten to a situation where somebody did something that is so terrible that you say to yourself, I will never forgive this person. Or you feel like you want to strangle and choke that person. 
If you say you want to release that anger and go somewhere and shout and scream, the moment you come and the person is in front of you again, what happens? Memory comes again, you remember everything again. I've seen people during the week, uh, somebody w went somewhere to go collect a document. And it was a document that somebody just needs to sign. Less than two minutes. And this individual was delayed for over two hours. And I called. So how is everything? And the person started talking. Now, I wasn't the one to sign the document. I'm not the one who is delaying the person for two hours. But the person was talking, hey, I don't know, I've been sitting here for two hours. The person was talking and the person was already angry. The anger was inside all along. There was nothing the person could do to express the anger to the individual because it's somebody that will, there will be serious consequences. But the person can put the anger inside. But nothing was being done to dissipate the anger. And the next, the first opportunity the person has to talk about the situation, the anger boiled out. Haven't you been in a situation where something happened to you, between you and your friend or between you and somebody? And days later, you are talking about the event, and the event still you're still talking about it with so much anger. So you really, we can't really do that. The easiest way I found that we can take away anger and truly be with someone who really offends us. Do something to us that we feel like we should remove their hair with their bare hands and grind them into powder and dust is to take all that anger and all that feeling and just put it before God. Say, God, help me deal with this. Believe you me, God can help us deal with it. One saving grace I will save that helped me with my own anger growing up. My dad used to say, when you are angry, very angry, you, apart from saying, do not talk, don't say anything, the angrier you get, the more quiet you should become. The second thing he used to say is, take your Bible. You cannot read your Bible 10 minutes and anger is still inside you. It's almost impossible. I think it's impossible. I've tried it many, many times. It's helped me to keep cool in situations where I would have caused mayhem. And I have a big capacity to cause damage if I want to cause damage, huge one. But I've learned when I'm very angry and I'm trying to dissipate it and I just take my Bible. I cannot think of going through the Bible and the anger still remains in, it in a short while. And that is how God begins to build in us this attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, patience and long-suffering. You are going through difficult situations and you are getting frustrated. You are not able to abide, okay, under that weight of suffering or, or situation. And you go through the Bible and for some reason you go read, for example, Habakkuk 3, 15 to 19, even if the fig tree does not blossom. And you read all of that. And you go through the account, maybe, the, or you remember the story of Job, or remember some things there, and you recognize that, you know what? Like Job says, even if God comes and takes a spear right now and he slays me and puts it through my chest. You know what Job said? I will still trust him. That is somebody who had patience. It comes only from God. Shouting, going out to do something extreme cannot take away that spirit of anger when we want to express it in a very bad way. It is only if we learn to give it to God that God can help us to do so. So we must learn to, re to release our anger appropriately. There are four ways people respond. And after the four ways, three of those ways are wrong. The first way is repression. People will re repress it. Somebody is making you angry. Your situation is making you angry. And you just keep it inside. You just you keep it inside, but you dwell on it. That's repression. It's like you put the anger inside you, and you begin to, hey, so this person did this to me. Child, I can't believe it. Eh? Ah, it's not this person's fault. Hi. Is it not because it's hard? Me. Hey, this person did this to me. Ah. In fact, the thing I'm going to do. Hey. You are repressing the anger. Okay, you didn't react instantly. You didn't immediately start doing what you're supposed to do. But you keep it inside. And you continue to dwell on it. That's repression. It will poison us. It will poison us. We are forgetting the cost of anger. It will poison us. That's the wrong way. 
to deal with anger. Then those who suppress it, when you suppress anger, you pretend it does not exist. I'll give you an instance. I have my food here, and I'm about to eat. And someone comes, and just dips their hand inside, takes the meat and other things, and walks away, and instantly feel angry. Ah, I just discounted it. Ah, no, it's no big deal. Just took my meat and rice. No problem. Let me continue. That's a bad way to deal with anger, because guess what? It will happen a second time, isn't it? It will happen a third time. It will happen a fourth time. It will keep coming, probably in a bigger way, to deny and refuse to recognize that a situation brings anger, is suppressing the anger, to pretend the anger is not there, and to, yeah, don't worry about it. To pretend it's not there is also not good. It's repressing it. And when you repress the anger, or you suppress the anger, what you are doing is causing your body to respond in ways that will actually damage you. I can't sit down and start telling you the chemical, but chemistry of all of that. But that's a bad way to also deal with anger. You must recognize anger for what it is. And to pretend it does not exist is not the right way. They used to say there are four different ways to respond. There is a passive type. I step on your toes. Passive person will not see anything. We just, and you remove the leg. And you act as if there's nothing happened. Yes, you are suppressing it. But it's painful. There's aggressive response. I step on your toes. I don't know, that's very common. You want to enter a vehicle. And the person who goes to shift, they didn't shift, they did you, and as you're entering, you now step on their toes. Instantly, pa, pa, ah, ah, over they will hit you immediately. Aggressive response. It's instant. You don't even think. You don't wait. You give me one, I give you two. Like they say, some people will jokingly say, give, and shall be given unto you. Press down. <laughs> That's an aggressive response. It's a bad way to deal with anger. The manipulative one. Somebody steps on your toes. It's painful. And you go to the person's friend. When the friend is there, hmm. Now wow. Hmm. Tosin. <laughs> is it good that somebody should step on somebody's toes? Is it possible that somebody will step on somebody's toes? You know they are stepping on somebody's toes. And the person is like, ah, how can somebody step on somebody's toes and the person? Like, and then the person who step on your toes is like, you don't turn and look at the person like this. <laughs> <laughs> An assertive response is the best way. You recognize the events. Somebody is stepping on my toes. And you, it's painful. And you touch the person, excuse me, sorry, you just stepped on my toes, though. You reacted in an assertive way. You've, the scriptures contains a lot of instances, because we think, sometimes when we think about when somebody slaps you on the right, on the left, we think that's not talking about assertiveness. Different Bible story for that one. But the thing is, you do not repress your anger, holding it inside and dwelling on it. You don't suppress it, pretending it does not exist, okay? You don't also express it in an uncontrollable way, where you react instantly and you use that anger and give it back. People will say, if you are good to me, I will be good to you. If you are not good to me, then I will not be good to you. I will treat you the way you treat me. That's a human way of, of reacting, isn't it? But that's not what God says children should be. He didn't say we should do like that. And the best way, of course, is to take it to God. Take the anger to God, and God will help us to deal with it. 1 John 1, 9. I'm quoting this because it can be applied to almost anything. Because on uh, uncontrollable, you know, bad way of expressing anger is sin. Because scripture says, be angry, but do not sin. And do not let your anger lead you to sin. And so if we know that we have anger issues, only Destiny and Bobby that is raising up their hands there. Hey, okay, Pamela. Yes. See, some people, okay, she raised up and let me not talk. Sometimes this mouth runs so, Hey, okay. I will keep praying for God, <laughs> to God. Pamela, where now? You say you want to raise, you raise up your hand. Is it like, did you watch this movie? She did like this, I, I saw Anna. Okay, marvelous. Anna, I know you did, where are you now? You know that story, when they are in class, and the teacher asks question, and the people raise up their hands, when they raise up their hand, they, they will not call them. They will call the ordinary raise up their hand. <laughs> 
I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, Pamela, I read. First John one nine. Yes, it says if we confess our sins, we take it to God. We are honest with ourselves and recognize where we are weak. And you go to God and confess it and put it before him. He says God is faithful and he is good enough. He is just and he will forgive us. And he says he will also cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Anger issue can be, can be something like that as well. Take every problem to God. And God will help us to overcome them. Okay? Finally, we need to change the way we think about life, about situations. Okay? Change how we think and about, about life and situation. Romans 12, 2 explains it the best. It says, be transformed by renewing of your mind. Change your thinking and change your life. If you can change our thought processes about life. You know, people will say, I don't want to go through life suffering. Me, I no go so far. I no go back for bread. A child. I, I hear that song a lot, and I don't sing songs like that. They say that he who lives in a glass house should not do what? Play games of throwing stones. As a child of God, do you have an enemy? Who is that enemy? Satan. Is he a gentle being? Does he sleep sometimes and rest sometimes? Let me give you an example of the kind of person the devil is. And you know this story, right? The book of Job. The children of God, sons of God were together. Maybe there was kind of a morning assembly or let's have a discussion about how things have been. Say Satan was there too. God said, ah, old man, ah, now, where did they come from? Hmm. I've just been walking up and down. I've been going to Jebu, Ikotu, Abarodje, Ketu, everywhere, up and down. I've been visiting all your friends and all your children. I've been, I've been going up and down. Say, hey, ah, God now said, ah, that means you must have, ah, you saw my servant Job, baby. Do you see how nice that guy is? Do you see how good he is? I beg, Baba God, that one I lie. <laughs> I beg, no be so. Person they see me, I no go suffer. I no go beg for bread. You know they suffer. You know they beg for bread. Why you say the guy I love you? I beg, now on now now on a film trick. And you, you are open, you are sitting there, you are using your mouth. Say I no go suffer. <laughs> Satan will go and meet God. God, this man, the child, no go suffer, no suffer. You know they suffer. How you prove? How was the evidence that this guy truly loves you? Let him suffer. You live in a glass house. You have somebody who's always looking for a way to bring you down. And you are going there, opening your mouth, flexing muscle. Ah, see my muscle. Hey, see muscle. Mm, mighty ego. Ah, it will send you home to come and deal with you. <laughs> if we can change our orientation, and the scripture does tell us so, isn't it? What does it say? In Acts, is it Acts 17 22, when Paul said he went and was encouraging and strengthening the souls of the brethren, telling them what? Who remembers that scripture? I've been to camp. Some beat my head plenty. I've forgotten the actual verse. Is it Acts 17 20? Is it Acts, Acts 14 21? Acts 17. It says 14 22. Thank you. Acts 14. You didn't go to camp. See? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I read it, sir. Acts 14 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. It was strengthening the souls of the disciples. You know what strengthening means? To make them strong. How is it strengthening them? Okay? Exhorting them to mm -hmm. continue in the faith. To continue in the faith, which is good. Uh, my brethren, continue in the faith. Mm -hmm. And saying, we must throw many tribulations. I beg, I beg, stop that one. I reject it in Jesus' name. Hey, I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg. Waiting be, eh? Which kind through many waiting? <laughs> Paul was saying, he was encouraging them, strengthening them to continue in the faith, to abide under any weight of whatever may come. And encouraging them and saying, through many troubles, tribulations, difficulties, we must, use the word must, isn't it? Enter the kingdom of God. Change my thinking, change your thinking. 
If you understand that, the Bible says, too many try out, we went out the kingdom of God. Romans 5.3 says, tribulations or suffering does what? Produces endurance. Long suffering. An endurance character. If we change the way we think, you see, the problem with us is that we think we don't, we don't want any inconveniences. We want life smooth, easy. And that is what takes a lot of the children of God into so many things they shouldn't do. Men and women. Men, males and females. This concept that I don't want to suffer. I want easy life. I want everything smooth. I don't want to, I don't want stress. I want convenience. I want ease. That mindset does not allow people to develop that attribute of the fruit of the spirit. Long suffering. You know what most people, they like this statement. I mean, for long you go, long you go is what? What is me or long you go in English? God has done it. Abi? Oh, God has given me glory. Okay, so is patience is, no, so is patience is, uh, is profitable. Who wants patience? I don't want patience, so we want God to do it. Care, 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 fast, fast. Remember what I said when I started with? We are always in a hurry. And patience is always the opposite. And it's one of the major enemies of our spiritual development. We are never patient. We want to jump before we can walk. We want to fly before we can jump. And so if we do not change the way we think, there's no way we can hope on to abide on that difficult situation to the point where God sees that, okay, this is my son or this is my child. And then he will open the gates of heaven and bless us as much as he wants. And, and we don't have these macro tumors, which is long anger with one another. And so we easily and readily throw each other away and throw each other under the bus. And we treat each other the way God said we should not do so. Romans 15 verse 5. Romans 15, 5. Stella, read, please. Mm -hmm. The God of what? Patience, okay? And comfort. And comfort. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you see, without that atti attribute of patience, which is part of the attributes of God, as we read in Exodus 34, verse 6, right? Long suffering with one another. There's no way our relationship with one another or with God can be the way it's supposed to be. Conclusion, Colossians 1, 11. Colossians 1, 11. Yes, please. Um, precious. Okay, wait. Namdi has not read before. <laughs> I can't hear you. Strengthen mm -hmm. all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering in joy. Okay. So this is Paul's prayer. And I think it should also be our prayer. Remember what I said. The key to effective relationship with God and with one another. Remember John, is it John 4.20 that says, if you say, or anyone says, I love God, but does not love or love less or hate his own brother, say he's a liar. How can you love God who you not see? Well, you can't even relate well or have a good relationship with somebody who is there with you, okay? And to love one another and to relate to one another and prove relations as God expects it to be, we need that macrotumos and the humonon or humone, whatever. <laughs> Abiding under difficult situations will help us to not lose faith and trust in God. Be impatient and slow to anger or long suffering one another will help us to still do what Christ said. By this, all men will know that they are my disciples if you have love one for another. So that's a fruit. And each of us should look at ourselves and ask, am I growing? Am I growing 
in this attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, patience. Am I long-suffering towards my fellow man? Am I abiding under difficult situations and still trusting God and not becoming depressed, losing hope, losing faith, getting irritable, angry, you know, whatever it is, under difficult situation. Each of those attributes build on each other. Love, all encompassing, okay? The next one, who can tell them what the next one is? Joy, isn't it? After joy, peace. And then after peace, patience. And look at it this way. Love is the foundation of it. Because you want to build a house. The foundation is not solid. Love towards God and love towards man. I must recognize that. I must love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my being, with all my soul. When they ask Jesus Christ, what is the greatest commandment? He said, oh, your relationship is the most important thing in this life. And the greatest commandment that addresses that. Relationship with God and your relationship with man. And all of them are summed up in love towards man and love towards God. And if you have that insight, then you are not going to be bothered about what is happening externally or what somebody is doing to me. There's going to be joy inside you, okay? Something that nothing can touch, nothing can take away. And if you have that joy inside you, then there's going to be calm, no matter the storm around you. That's peace. And for that peace to maintain, you need a lot of patience. All of them sort of follow each other. And if we know these and we are constantly, actively working and asking God to help us to grow in each of these, then we are growing as he wants us to be. And our relationship with him and with one another will be as it is. Any question? Yes, sir. He said anger is the second emotion. Yes. And my question is, what's the first emotion? Oh, the first emotion is always, diff is always different. That's why. Right. Let me give you an instance. Um, somebody... Comes and takes my food. Are we? And I instantly feel angry. And I want to react. And I say to myself, no. I feel like standing up and just chasing him and slap him immediately. The first emotion I have, frankly, one, is surprise. And two, frankly, there's even shock there. There's surprise. Ah, how can this person come and take my food? Surprise is my first emotion. And why am I surprised? The two things I will ask myself, why am I surprised that this person did this? If Ruth, Tosin, Shola, or Ruth, or those around me, they are eating, you think I can pass and take your meat? <laughs> the first emotion is how close am I, how familiar am I with these people, okay? Is it playing with me or what? So if my, the first instant is they feel angry, then they should, I might feel angry. He took my meat. Why did he take my meat? Is it playing? Is it joking? Is it because he's just trying to slide love and sharing? <laughs> Whatever it is, it will be different for different situations. So if you can just stop and try to find out and think, what is the first emotion I feel? Is it that I feel insulted? Is it that I feel, uh, you know, belittled or whatever? So why do I feel so? Then should I feel so? If you can explore those other emotions, the anger that instantly comes like this, because it's not the, not the first thing, that will, it's just the most transparent, the most obvious. If you can think back to why we are feeling that anger, we might find a way to diffuse the anger before we react on it. I found this worked for me. When I'm angry and something happens and I'm very, those who have been around me probably might tell you, say, and something happens to me and I'm very angry. The, if the anger is really very big, I won't say much. If I need to talk about it, I will be almost pontificating. I will be speaking as I'm speaking to a child. And if the response that is coming at me is one that, because you know, especially for guys, you know what? <clears throat> you know guys, most men are very physical, isn't it? And we rely a lot on strength. Most women are not that physical. So what do you rely on much? <laughs> Mouth. So, if, there is, um, if, you, if it's happening between a guy and a lady now, and something happens, and let's go, 
You think the guy has a a guy wants to do? What do you think most guy wants to do? Now to that to react, danga. And so, wise guys will learn to first of all stop. And I've I've had an inter, inter I have I've had situation where you will see guys they will beat up a lady, and after that they were like I, I I didn't want to I was provoked. Excuse me. She provoked you. You have to recognize you are provoked. What should you do? Process it. Reflect on it. But when you act on how you feel, it's always going to be disastrous. So, it, But if you process it and you reflect on it, then the degree of anger you want to do. And each person has to find a way by which they can diffuse. It's either like a walk away. And I think it's where the guy wants to walk away. Or he's even two, two people. Say, my friend, come here. My friend, come here. <laughs> I'm talking to you. And then go and lock the door. You you cannot go anywhere. You must listen to me first. You better be counting one to one thousand in your head. <laughs> but anger is really very deadly. If you ever sit down, and if you understand about chemistry, and you you understand what happens when your bodies release those chemicals, adrenaline and epinephrine, and you are angry when you are afraid or you are you are anxious, or you are worried, and you are, you, are, you are troubled. And how they go into your body, and how they begin to affect every organ. You will do your level best to try and quickly diffuse and take anger out of you. And that's, I, I believe one of the best ways to do it is always take it to God. Because as human beings, you know, it's possible to hold a plate of food in your hand that is hot, and you don't immediately release your hand. You do like this, you do like this until you can put it down. It's, it's my own way of thinking. It's a small way of our parasympathetic nervous system that's similar to how God's Spirit might help us to cope under things that are difficult. Because only God can help you cope with situations that's unbearable. And you can bear it, and you're not even be doing like this. You can bear it, and it will just wash over you as water washing over stone. And it's not affecting you at all. I used to sit, tell people that somebody angers you, and it's not somebody you can walk away from, somebody who is around you, and you can't walk away from them. The only way you can relate with those individuals without being a hypocrite. You know it's possible you are angry with someone, and you do not like someone. And you see the person, hey, hello, how are you? And you are greeting the person, and you are laughing at the person. But as, a, as soon as you walk away, Oh, no, Maybe because there are other people, and if there's nobody, that person passes you, you just do your face like this. But if there are people there, you don't want them to know. Hey, hello, how are you? Like, <laughs> you immediately do your face like this. The only way you can truly have an open heart to greet and relate with someone who you are angry with because of something they've done to you, and your heart is truly open and pure, and you are not having an iota of anger or animosity towards them, is if God has taken that anger from you. It does not mean you don't remember what has been done or what has happened. It doesn't mean so. God has just replaced you with something else. It's only the Spirit of God that can make that happen. If you've experienced that, you understand what I mean. And there's nothing good more than that in this world. To be able to take great, you know, uh, provocation, recognize the provocation, embrace it, process it and release it back and be able to move around without your center your peace affected at all nothing beats that in this world from my own from my own point of view any other question yes please i want to, want to confirm again is our anger already inside us or does it come in actually the anger is generated in us from what happens but it's a spirit also that's you know the scripture says Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And he broadcasts his signals, okay? We have the antenna inside us. The, the calls that I receive, if you call my phone now, okay? You know, where is the call coming from? Or let me use the word, radio or TV, okay? So is the, the videos, the images, are they inside the TV? Even though we are looking at them inside the TV. Are they inside the TV? No. They're not. They're actually in the air, right? But there's a receiver in the TV that takes the signal. 
It just translates it and we see it as pictures, okay? That's the way anger works. Every emotion, we have the receiver in our heart and is attuned to it. So when there's a trigger, something external comes up and it's our receiver receives it, we instantly will respond. That's us translating that signal into something that is visible outside. So it's for us as well, my opinion, to simply get God to give us a signal that will be what, what you call a dampener or a signal jammer. You see, if you don't want in some offices, when they say don't use phone during work hours, some people will still have phone. They go into the toilet and they make phone calls. All you need to do is to have a signal jammer. You just have the thing. It just could be something small like this. You just place it somewhere in the room. No call can ever go out. Try and receive call, it won't go out. The signals are in the air, but this is, that thing is blocking the signals from a touching your own signal. So that's why I say if we have anger issues, I will take it to God. God says he can give us his Holy Spirit. And if one of the attributes of, his, of, his, of the Holy Spirit is long-suffering patience, it will more like provide us a kind of a signal jammer that helps us to be able to not respond to the signals and the trigger in a way that is wrong, that is sin. This is the, way, it's the best way I can explain it. It's the best way I can explain it. That's, that's how I say it, yeah. Okay, any other question? Who is already angry with me that I'm spending too much time? <laughs> ten minutes over. Okay, Paul says he's angry. I've spent ten minutes over. But so let's quickly end it so that his anger can come now. <laughs> okay, we will, as I said, it's going to be a good, yeah, not too long though, uh, service today. So we'll have like, uh, Paul, how many minutes? Ten. Ten, fifteen minutes. Okay, that's like one thousand and fifteen minutes. <laughs> Say ten, fifteen. 1,015 minutes. Okay, it's a 10 to 15 minutes break. <laughs> and then we'll start the service. Don't make a way by my laptop charger. Thank you. <laughs> no, they, they put three in front. Peace.
I'd like to have everyone on their seats as the service is about to start. Thank you.
that was a beautiful start for the second song. Please turn a little bit forward to page 173. Page 173 says, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Rejoice in the Lord always. Philippians 4, verse 4, page 173. Makes me to lie down in green pastures. Take from Psalm 23, verse 2. And after this, our brother and friend, Mr. Nadia Nia, will come up for the opening prayer. Page 15.
There have been our dwelling place in all ages before the mountains were brought forth from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather before your presence here this morning. As you have commanded, Father, we pray that everything that we'll be doing will be blessed by you. Bless the speaking, bless the hearing as well. Father in heaven, we pray that by the time we'll live here, we'll live here better. Father, continue to bless everything. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for hearing our prayer because we have prayed in the name of the Son, our Lord, so coming King Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to remain standing, standing, as there is not going to be any sermon this morning, this afternoon, rather. So, for the first song, please turn with me to page 11. Page 11, the heavens, God's glory do declare. And the firmament shows his handiwork. Psalm 19, verse 1, page 11.
Okay. Um, good afternoon, once again, brethren. Good afternoon, sir. Sabbat shalom. Um, I want to welcome all of you uh, once again to this Sabbath service. Uh, we have with us some of those who are with us uh, at the youth camp, the Nuka girls finally rejoined one of the Glamour girls and the fourth member, another fourth member of the Glamour girls is here today as well. And we're happy to have them, even those from Abuja are still here with us. Uh, we enjoyed a wonderful camp. We were so blessed that we had a week of no rain. And the, I think it was on Sunday when we departed that rain started. And that was really very good. Thank all of you for your prayers. Everyone re reported back and got home safely. Those going to Wari and those uh, who also left for Benin, Victor. And uh, Paul and uh, Benjamin are in Ghana. We'll be fellowshiping with them today before departing next week as well. I want to ask again, as we used to do, to continue to pray for one another. Those who are unable to be here with us, I'm not seeing Mr. Lalebo here. I'm hoping that all is well with her. I've not been able to actually talk to David, our son. Um, if you can also send our text messages, though she might not read it, I've sent a couple. I'm not sure she's read them. But she told me to connect with David. But please put her in your prayers as well. Um, for the FOT, we have not yet, interestingly, been able to um, get a definite location for feast. It's not as if we haven't gotten, really. The options are in terms of cost. I think the cheapest we have found for the least accommodation is 10000 per night. And the least they are giving us for meals is 1,500 per meal. So that is what is actually causing a delay. But we're hoping that uh, the, by, before the end of this month, which we just leave it like a month or so before the feast, because I think it's on October 10th or so, we will be able to have a definite place because one other place uh, asked that the team who visited them should visit again to maybe have another discussion. So please continue to put that in your prayers. Things are getting so, so difficult. And one of the major reasons for all of them, as we are all aware, is that the cost of diesel has gone up. And they definitely require that they will often have to give us at least some power. Even when we are negotiating to pay for some diesel in some of the halls, it's still very difficult. Uh, and the one and premier that we used last is one that is offering us that 10,000 minimum. They're offering us that 10,000 per, per night, which is a far cry from what we used to get from them. So let's put it in prayer. I will use this opportunity to encourage us to recognize, as I, as I said this before, despite the fact that it's 10,000 per night, probably maybe less than 40 or 30, 40% 40 of us are those who are definitely going to be unable to make that, pay that, that amount of money for the feast. If we have been faithfully keeping our second side and planning some savings towards it from the beginning, at the end of one feast to the, to the end of the next, God does promise that he will bless us and that in blessing he will bless us and he will make it possible for us to keep that, that feast. But we often do not um, prepare for it ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> Olumide needs a file. Olumide, can I send it to your email? Okay. Um, just give me a minute, please. I, I decided to put the message on, on a presentation so that um, it can be a bit easier to at least follow up. It will also help me to not spend too much time. Okay. 
So in the interim, I will appreciate that all of us should really consider our own part in preparing for the feast because the preparation for the feast is supposed to start at the beginning, you know, at the beginning, at the beginning of the year after the feast. And if we plan for it ahead, and I mentioned this before, as it says in scriptures, that you're supposed to use your tithes, your vows, and every other thing you may have planned to use for the feast in attending, to use for the feast and plan it ahead. Whether it's your second tithe, whether you have extra money, you plan for it. The Bible says we should use all of that and plan to attend the feast. And that's something that I feel most of us don't actually, you know, take into consideration. There are those who will just wait uh, two months or three months and they will estimate, okay, this is what the feast will cost. Then they will try and look what is possible within the next those two months to try and use that to, to attend the feast. But if we all do what we're supposed to do, I do believe even if it's 20, 30 percent, or 40 percent of us have extra second time, with what we are, what we will often request from the Home Office, we definitely will be able to keep the feast and support one another, and all of us will have a very a wonderful feast. And you have a flash drive, I probably think, you have a flash drive, okay, you sit on, this, on the desktop. Uh, apologies, let me copy it for you. appreciate you putting it in, uh, in your prayers um, concerning the feasts so that God will help us and let his will be done on that regard. Okay, what you said. Okay, brethren, today I want to also take for this sermon another of the fruits of the Spirit. There are nine of them. And so far we have taken love, joy, peace, and patience. So today we want to take kindness. It's interesting that when you study this, uh, when you study these attributes, some of them look as if they're similar. And yet when you study them in detail, you will see the subtle differences that are also very glaring in what they are. So today I want to look at this one, this afternoon, the one that is called kindness. I took the fruit of the Spirit, obviously, from the book of Galatians, chapter 5, which we read today, from verse 22 and 23, which says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which we did earlier, and then I'm taking kindness. 
kindness. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> kindness. Okay, not long suffering. Initially, I was going to use the Bible study as a presentation, too. So that's why long suffering is highlighted there. So it's kindness that I'm going to be um, looking at. And we're going to look at that kindness. Earlier, when I was doing the Bible study and I was looking at long suffering, and I used the word patience, on the screen is the reason why I keep using patience. As I said, in modern translations, a lot of translations use patience. You can see a lot of uh, translations there that use patience, 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 patience. Let's turn to Matthew 25, 22, and read from verse 36 to verse 39. Matthew 22, from verse 36 to 39. Okay. Jesus was asked a statement by a lawyer, and I mentioned this and alluded to this again in the Bible study. He was asked a statement, and they asked him, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He says this is the first and the great commandment. Verse 39 says, And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If I want to summarize what Christ said here, he used the word love, but he was talking really about relationships. Remember that what we're talking about really is the secret to healthy relationships in the fruits of the Spirit and the nine attributes. And when looking at kindness in this regard, Christ said that nothing else matters in this life more than relationship. Nothing else matters. And that is the relationship between us and God and the relationship between us and one another. See, we can have everything, maybe. We might be successful in every other area of life. If we cannot succeed in our relationship with God and in our relationship with man, we haven't succeeded at all, was what Jesus Christ was saying there. Nothing else matters more than relationships. That's what Christ was saying. The relationship between God and the relationship between man. That's all there is. And that is easy because God is a relational God. I'm not turning there or showing that, but in Genesis 126, the scripture says, God said, let us make man in our image. For what purpose? Does he need man to worship him or what? Is he not all sufficient? Is it that he needs the worship of man, the obedience of man, the accolades of man or what? It's just because he wants a relationship. What God wanted was to bring many sons into sons and daughters, obviously, into his into his family. Now, in relationships, okay, there is a love that a word that we use for love in action. And that word is kindness. That is the attribute of the spirit we want to look at today. Love in action. Because we think love is a feeling, it's not, it's a choice. We've gone through this before. But when you put that choice into action, you translate it into something tangible, something measurable, that actually is kindness. And it's an extension of the fruit of the Spirit. Kindness. Sometimes we will say, okay, you know, that's not a big, that's not a big deal. Relationship between God and man. But for me, Relationship with God is the most important thing. And as long as I love God, I think that's about the most important thing. Look at what the Bible says. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. 1 John 4, 20. It says, if someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, or you love them any less than you love God, the scripture says the person is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen?
The Greek word used in the Galatians 5.22 to describe kindness is gentleness, okay? And the Greek word for gentleness, incidentally, is krestos. Krestos. C-H-R-E-S-T-O-S. Krestos. Who can guess what the Greek word for Christ is? Christos. Christos. It's just one letter separating it. In fact, according to one uh, researcher, about 2,000 years ago, in the Roman Empire, okay, when the Romans and the people around look at Christians, they often call them, oh, these are Christos. This is not how in Antioch they call them Christians for the first time. Because they believe, they behave like Christ. They began to use the word, use the word Christos for Christos. And they started calling the apostles or the Christians people who are gentle. And they call Christianity the gentle religion. The gentle religion because of the way they were there. Remember earlier I, in talking about, in the first introduction to this, I looked at kindness and goodness. And I talked about kindness is when you do good to people who do not deserve it, for no reason, for no, for, for absolutely no reason. You are just being nice to them. That love in action. Because love is an outgoing concern. And there's nothing selfish about, there's nothing selfish about it. The Bible also teaches us that the act of Jesus Christ coming down to earth to die for mankind, what did we do to deserve it? Nothing. God chose to create man okay. foolish, disobedient, misled, and enslaved to all sorts of desires and pleasures, living in malice. Jesus Christ is the kindness of God. That's what the Bible is saying. He is our Savior and is the kindness of God. And that's how God demonstrated his love for us. Is that what it says in Romans? That at the right time, God demonstrated his love for us in that Christ came and died for the ungodly. He saved us, verse 5, not by the righteous deeds we have done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of new birth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. These are just justified by grace. We will become heirs, heirs with the hope of eternal life. If we want to know what kindness is, we want to understand kindness in its full, then study the life of Christ. The things he did, the way he responded, the way he behaved, how he treated those who opposed him, how he treated those who hated him, how he treated those who are his disciples, how he related to of what example that he should do. We want to look at about how God has been kind to us. Perhaps if what it is, and seek and ask God to give us that attribute of his spirit and that it keeps on growing in us. You know, 1 Peter 1, verse 5 to 10 talks about be more diligent to your faith. So many virtues that God has put in our hearts in action that we truly can say God be kind to you and I. We will look at at least four ways it has been kind to us. So understand this, we're supposed to measure anyone. We're supposed to measure ourselves. Because each of us, we are told in Philippians 2, 12, to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. And we're supposed to grow in his grace and in knowledge. That's what it says in 1 Peter 3, 18. So how has God been kind to me? How has God been kind to you and I? In understanding that, perhaps we might understand what kindness is and this attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. First one, and I hope by extension we can extend that same kindness to those around us. How has God been kind? First one, God understands my weakness. He understands our weaknesses. He understands it thoroughly. Okay? See, understanding and kindness actually go together. If you have been hungry, and you know what hunger is, if you have been poor, and you know what hungry, you see someone who is poor, you see someone who is in pain, you will be more moved to react to them with kindness. Do they deserve it? Do you know them? Do you know anything about them? No, you don't. But you understand the situation. People who have never known lack, who have never understood what it is to be in need, 
will see someone in need and what they will feel is irritation or anger. If you understand something, you can more react to it with kindness. And the scripture says the same as well. We will read it. Understanding and kindness go together. Why is God kind to us? I'm not turning there, but in Psalm 103, the scripture says God knows. He understands our faith. He knows. Understanding is why God is able to treat us with of one another. Okay? You the larger the population gets, the more the tendency to be unkind to one another. Because everybody will know each other and they will understand each person's situation. The closer you are to someone, the more you are able to associate with There was a video, a short video I saw, many of you may have seen it on WhatsApp. It says, do not judge me. Do not judge my actions. Do not judge the things I am doing. Do not judge me by who I am. Because you don't even understand the things I have gone through. You do not understand where I am coming from. So you have no reason, you have no right to judge me. That statement is made by someone. But my point here is this. Understanding makes us being kind. That a little bit later on. So how is God kind to us? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, 15 to 16. Is it on the screen? Is it on the screen? Okay. Hebrews 4, 15 to 16, I'm reading from the contemporary English version. Trying to bring out the meaning in the more English, you know, more modern word. Jesus understands every weakness of ours because he was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. That separated him from us. So whenever we are in need, we should come bravely before the throne of our merciful God. Remember that message I gave one time. That the symbol of God's power. The symbol of who he is, of his sovereignty. His throne is called the mercy seat. Because he understands us. Therefore he can be kind towards us. There we will be treated with undeserved kindness, grace. New King James Session, that might find grace to help in times of need. And grace is undeserved kindness. And we will find help. Brethren, Jesus is not shocked when we are tempted. He's not shocked when we have difficulties or we struggle with sin or we fall. He knows what it's all about. He knows what it feels like. But the difference between us and him is he was never tempted to fall or to sin. Because he understands what all those entails. It makes him able to walk with us, to bring us back to where we should be, to restore us back. It's now up to us whether we want him to or we want to stay falling. See, that's the difference. God is a God of love, but also a God of justice. But his love makes him kind because he understands our frame and understands who we are. Doesn't excuse it, but he makes him be kind in doing steps, stuff, things he will do to bring us back. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 to 2. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 to 2, the New Living Translation is what I'm using here. Because some will say, you know, so what? How does understanding one another have anything to do with being kind with our brothers? Jesus Christ and God are different things. But here's what it says. Their brothers and sisters, if another Christian is overcome by some sin, you who are godly, should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right story that Jesus Christ told when he said he was in the temple, standing at the mouth of the temple. And there was a Pharisee, supposedly one of the, in quotes, men of God, and a tax collector. 
collect bribes, cheat people and stuff like that. And they came to pray. And the Pharisee may not understand at all the situation of tax collector. And he came in the self-righteous godliness. You know, I thank God I am not like that person. The scripture says, if you feel that you are godly, and you know that you are godly, and you have a brother or a sister who you know and you can see is caught in some sin, say, you that you are godly, say, bring him back gently and with humility. Not self-righteousness, not arrogance, not condemnation. Not judgmentalism. And you know, judgmental is not telling someone that this is not right. You know, I can come to you and I can say, What? You mean this is what you're doing? So you're such a wicked person, wicked soul. Ah, you will rot in the lake of fire. You better change this or else you will die in the lake of fire. In fact, the judgment of God will come down upon you. In Jesus' name, I'm telling you this. And I can come to you and I can tell you. What are you doing? Honestly, really, do you really feel this is what we're supposed to do? The word of God says this is not how we're supposed to behave. Honestly, you need to find a way to seek God. Repentance is towards God. Repent towards God. And seek God's help to help you overcome this. So that you can be right with Him. My attitude, my tone, my motive, the entire language and how I address that issue will determine whether I am humbly and gently reproving and bringing that person back. Or I am standing there in judgment, in condemnation. I'm not turning there, but you know there's a place in John, 1 John, that talks about you. Stand there and you judge your brother and you condemn them. So you are standing in place of the lawgiver. There's only one lawgiver, and that is God. Be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's troubles and problems. And in this way, obey the law of Christ. Some people will say, share with me. Brethren, if we truly want to understand how to be kind, the first way to do so is to be gentle and not condemnatory or judgmental. That is the first week we learn how to be kind. In what other way has God been kind to me, to you, to all of us? God reveals the truth to us about ourselves, about our nature, about the things we do. He reveals it in his word, but we must study it. And when he reveals it, he doesn't couch it, he doesn't hide it. It's there, it's glaring. And that's what God does. God loves us enough that he reveals the truth to us. And if we understand that his aim, his goal, the basis from where he's talking to us is love, it will indeed set us free. John 8.32 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Iron sharpens iron. So a friend sharpens the countenance of another. Are you a good friend? Are you kind to your friend? Do you tell your friends the truth? Or do you keep it away from them and discuss it with everybody else but them with a view to paint them bad, make them look bad, wicked, evil? You don't begin, if you do that, you don't even understand what it means to be kind. The most unkind thing anyone can do is to hide the truth from someone. And you go paint it everywhere else. 
Incidentally, most people don't like hearing the truth. So that's probably one of the reasons why. Most people don't want to hear the truth. You tell them the truth, they immediately bristle up. I remember a situation that happened some years ago. There was this young man who was told by a friend of his, you know, when you are not happy with someone, or you feel someone has done something that you do not like, you become aggressive, insolent, arrogant, and frankly, very, very annoying. And honestly, you have a lot of good qualities, but you need to work on this. When you are angry, you just talk to people anyhow. You behave anyhow. You, you, have become, you become arrogant, insolent, indolent, and very, very aggressive. And the friend was, and the guy was like, no, I'm not like that. No, I'm not like that. And then he called a friend of his, a really good friend of his. He said, let me, well, I'm, I'm coming, let me tell you. Uh, uh, come, 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 come. Yeah, come. Tell him what you just said. And they repeated the same thing to his friend. A very close friend, it's almost like a best friend. And the friend said, well, the truth is actually, they are correct, that's how you are. You really are like that. The only reason I don't talk is that many times when I'm trying to tell you, you know, this, you just become more arrogant, become more insolent, more aggressive and stuff, and I don't just like wahala. That's why I just let it, but actually that's the truth, that's how you are. Guess what happened? That friend became his enemy instantly. He refused. Later on, he went to him and said, hey, so you, did, so you, did, you, 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 you have, did you say this one about me, eh? Me, that I'm not like that, me, that I'm not like that. Most people don't want to hear the truth. I always say that if someone tells you you are arrogant, it is actually arrogant to say, I'm not, I'm not arrogant. I'm actually very humble. That's actually arrogant. If someone tells you that you are rude, I can't see myself as, I'm, as I am. Can I see myself? I can't. I can only see a portion of myself. The only way I can see the top of my head is if I do like this in the mirror, but I don't even see it well. Truly, I used to ask my wife to take a picture on top of my head when I want to check something there. So I can see whether there is a wound there or some hairs I have lost some hair. I'm trying to make sure I don't lose too many hairs these days. <laughs> but guess what? People outside, they will see you, isn't it? But here's the thing. People have different eyesight, right? And there are some people whose eyes are short-sightedness or long-sightedness or they are stigmatic in their eyesight. So if somebody, some are using glasses and the glasses are tinted and some are not tinted, some are plain. And so people will see you based on how their own eyesight is. And what they see is what they will say. So if somebody tells you you are arrogant, you know what? You actually might not be arrogant through and through. But an aspect of how you interact with that individual comes across as arrogant. I've seen someone who works like this. Hey, hello, how are you? How is everything? Oh, okay, thank you, thank you very much. I'm grateful. It's, it's good. It's just arrogance. The person is not arrogant. <laughs> the person has a low self-esteem. And they've been telling this person, stop being so shy. And in order, in order not to appear shy, the person started walking like this. <laughs> Feeling that's a confident walk. So, hey, how are you? Thank you. <laughs> Some people are reserved. And they're quiet. Okay? They just, by nature, they're reserved. They're quiet. They're introverts. You might look at them and feel this person is snobbish. Does he feel or does she feel he or she is better than every one of us? I mean, when Jesus were talking, this person is just not even, just going to stay by himself or herself. Or herself. So people can, it's what they see. What you need to do is say, oh, I'm so sorry, I came, I'm, I'm, I, you feel that. Can you explain to me what do I do that comes across as arrogant to you? Can you explain to me what I do that comes across as proud? Can you explain to me what I do that shows I'm ungrateful? It's a simple thing to ask. When you ask that and they tell you, and these are relationships you value, you can see where they're coming from, and you can decide to make amends. 
if it's important enough or relationship is important enough. Okay? So, when people say, this is how we are, we often don't want to listen. We rather want to hear the good stuff. If somebody tells you I have two news for you, good news and bad news, which one do you want to hear first? Everybody wants to hear the good news first. There's a book written by a man called Jamie Buckingham. And you know what he wrote in the book? <laughs> He said, the truth will set you free. But first, it will make you miserable. That's quite true. I'm sure many, many ladies probably agree with that about some things. The truth will set you free, but first, it will make you miserable. You know, the scripture says in Jeremiah 10, 17, the heart of man is deceitful above all things. Did God say, the heart of Nigerians, the heart of Africans. Did he say the heart of Yabu people, Oweri people, Bini people? No, he says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The scripture says there is none who see yourself you are good. To so praise yourself, love yourself first. Love yourself, you are good. To so praise yourself, love yourself first. The Bible is clear in terms of how we are, how our responses are. The Bible doesn't mince words. David was a man after God's own heart. And when he messed up, God sent his nephew, Nathan, to go confront him. When you care about someone, when you are a good friend and you want to show kindness to them, telling them the truth is an act of kindness. Telling them the truth so that it can improve, that it can change, is an act of kindness. Hiding the truth from your friends because you are of their reaction or because you don't want to cause wahala is an unkind act. It is actually evil, not just unkind, to not take that same truth and tell everybody else but that individual. God understands our weaknesses and he tells us the truth about who we are. Confront us our minds to it and refuse. You have been kind when you tell the truth to, us, to someone. That is kindness. It's up to them to accept it or not, isn't it? They say you can take a horse to the water, but you cannot force it to read. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. This is from the Amplified Bible. Sometimes I read the Amplified Bible to look at the various uh, antonyms that they will use in some of the words that are in, this, in the scriptures. It says, rather, let our lives lovingly, lovingly express truth in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, and living truly. And living truly. Proverbs 24, verse 26. It's interesting how this is, and I don't know how many people, I, I, I decided to show this one, to show an example of why it's sometimes good. So look at various translation, various scriptures and various translations. It says, he who gives a right answer kisses the lips. What does that mean? So if somebody asks you, what's your name? My name is Tochuku Susu and So. It means we are kissing his lips. <laughs> They use flowery language in those days. Look at how it is in the contemporary English version. It says, giving an honest answer. It's a sign of true friendship. You see, in the Mediterranean, you remember Paul said, greet each other with what? A holy kiss. Nobody has been with a holy kiss. <laughs> He's talking about 
in, in the olden days then, when somebody visits you and you kiss them, it's actually showing how, how valued they are to you. And you accept them as important people in your lives. So when he says another, he says, it's a sign of true friendship. And if indeed we want to grow in that attitude of this, that attribute of the spirit, kindness, then we learn to tell the truth to one another because God does without mincing words. In the scriptures, look at the, the Bible. The Bible is an account of how God interacted with his children, with mankind. And guess what God did? Every single one of those men and women were with all their faults. God listed them there. And he confronted each of them with it. And each of us, if we study the scriptures, we will find one or two or a couple of things about ourselves that is clearly, glaringly outlined in scriptures that we need to work on. And that's what God does. And we need to do that to one another. And when we do that, it means we are growing in kindness. The best kind of friend you can have is one who loves you, cares enough about you, so much that he or she will tell you the truth as they see it. If you have a friend and you are afraid to tell them the truth, I will value those friends who can look me in the eye and tell me my faults. Those friends who will tell me my, to my face the truth about what I do and how they see it. They will correct me strongly. If you have a friend that you can't correct them, strongly and tell them, my friend, what, what, what is this? You can't be doing this kind of thing. No, 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 I expect more from you. Please, you need to stop all of this. I say, excuse me, which, which one is your, are you my father? Are you my mother? I mean, come out, come out from here. You know that person doesn't take you as a friend. But you have been a good friend. Most people don't want to hear the truth. You tell them the truth, what well, is what you are bringing on your head. You be a good friend. It's up to them to choose to value that friendship or not. Number three. Okay, before that, number three. God forgives our sins. God forgives our sins. The third way by which God shows kindness to us. God doesn't carry a grudge. Okay? He's not a God of shame. He forgives my sins, your sins. Why? Is it because we deserve it? No. It's because of his grace. Undeserved kindness. But obviously there is something he sees in us. A desire to grow. An acknowledgement of that sin. A repentance to be, and, and a desire to be better, to do better. And a sincere willingness that cannot be hidden to move forward and grow beyond those weaknesses. And when God forgives, he forgives. The scripture says, I will remember your sins no more. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he will take away his sins, our sins, from himself. And he will remember them no more. He says if it is as red as scarlet, he will make them as white as snow. He doesn't keep score. Remember Christ's statement. He was asked by Peter, how many times do I forgive my brother if he sins against me? Is it seven times or three times? He said 70 times seven. 490. This is not taking God for granted. But I am so glad God doesn't count. Okay, number one. <laughs> it's now number two. Okay, no problem, I forgive you. It's now number three. Now, for us human beings, if God says 70 times seven, how many times have you offended God in the last one year? In thoughts, in what, in deeds. What if he's counting? I'm just keeping score. Once he reaches a 490 like this, okay, I will deal with this person. And this person says, ah, this is now 448. Hey, okay, 
448 is very small, it's very close. Maybe it's 490 we want. 487, no problem. I forgive you with all my heart. You know, it's already 487. <laughs> I forgive you. And you are sharpening the tree. I'm going to use the G with that person. Just three more, three more chances to go. Incidentally, after that statement, Jesus Christ, I'm not turning there though. There was another parable he gave to the children of Israel. He was talking about forgiveness. That's when I talk about when you have done what is your duty. Say to yourself, I am an unprofitable servant. So God says, for this, for seven times seven is okay. And you are counting for, for this, seven times seven. You are an unprofitable servant. You must go beyond and above what you are told to do. Okay? Isaiah 54, verse 8. Isaiah 54, verse 8. In a little wrath, that is anger, there was a moment, for a moment, but, but, with unending, everlasting kindness, will I have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. I hid my face from you. I was angry with you. And I wanted to recognize what it means when I am angry with you. That's what he's saying. Several other scriptures show also. I hid myself from you. I took away my protection, my blessing, my guidance, my, my gift, my, my protection from you. So you can see the consequences of making me angry, upsetting me, not doing what I want. And the reason is not just to punish you, not to see you suffer, not to see you in pain, but so that you can come back to me. And he said with unending, everlasting kindness, undeserved good. It's still part of that third point. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 is our part, okay, on this aspect of forgiveness. Because we say, so, that's good. You know, God is good. Man cannot forgive and forget. We can forgive, but if the person does something again, you just, that's when we just come back and, you know, you double the whole, the punishment, you let go. Or the consequence, you let go that time. The second one, like, the ones you remember, you double it and add it on top of it. Ephesians 4.32 says, and someone, for the sake of doing good, but you see, it's when you understand their situation, when you understand what it means to be in that situation, you understand the environment, the circumstances, that you step out of your way undeserved to be nice to them, to be good to them. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Don't let your heart be hard like stone. Soft-hearted, it says. Tender, soft. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Okay. And finally, the fourth way that God is kind to us is that He affirms our word. He affirms our word. What do I mean by affirms? To affirm is to confirm, to establish, okay? Our word. Is it the one I wrote there? Psalm 139, verse 16 to 17. I'm reading in the Living Bible, okay? In a paraphrase to bring out the meaning, sort of. It says, You saw me before I was born, and you scheduled each day of my life. My life, your life. You saw me before I was born. He says so. He's telling us if I feel worthless, I feel nobody cares about me. 
tell God he loves me. I don't have anyone. I have no future. I don't have resources. I don't have access to servant or whatever. I'm looking at others having stuff that I cannot even ever hope to have. God says to us, say, you saw me before I was born and scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. You schedule each day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. How precious it is, Lord, to realize that you are thinking about me constantly. What a joy. I have worth before the creator of the universe. That is a kindness I do not deserve. I don't know about you, but that's a kindness God gives to us. How much more should I therefore do to others? He says, I have done this for you, set you an example so that you can also do likewise. You are thinking about me constantly. Isaiah 49 verse 16. Behold, I have engraved you upon the palms of my hands. The hand is our most busy, most frequently used organ. And anything that is there, that shows how worth, how much worthy we are. In terms of worth, in terms of value, before God, He values us. Every single creation he did. That's why he says God is not interested in the death of a sinner. Even the people of Sodom and Gomorrah that he destroyed. The people of Canaan that God would tell the Israelites. That used to bug me and worry me as I was growing up reading about those accounts. That God would tell them, the Israelites, go into this land. I, Amalek, kill every one of them. Men, women, and children. What? Men, women, and child, wipe them all out. The one time they did not kill all of them, they left some of the young women to be taken as slaves and stuff like that, and some cattle, God was upset with them. Kill the cattle even, kill everything, dogs and stuff like that. Kill all of them. That bugged me a lot. And so 17, and I understood the meaning of the eighth day. And that showed me how much this he says, I have engraved you upon the palms of my hand. Deep inside, everyone wants to be valued, to be appreciated, to be loved, to be cared for. We do a lot of things so that we can be relevant. Many people volunteer for that purpose. They want to feel a sense of value, a sense of worth, a sense of, you know, something, that they have watched something. They want to... I'm not talking about people who want to impress so that they can be praised. No, but they want, everybody appreciates some form of recognition. A lot of what we do as human beings goes around that. But you know, if our self-worth is compared based on, or is, is compared based on how people, individual, human beings sees us, we might set up, we might be setting probably almost certainly setting ourselves up to fail. Because no matter how good you are, well, you give of yourself, your resources, your time, your energies to do something, there are those who will look at you and they will despise you. I remember a story an old friend of mine told me of their daughter who was transferred to a company. And in a company, when they have jobs to do, it takes like a week or two for the secretaries to do that task. And these young undergrad, these young graduates lady got there and will do the whole thing in a day, Excel. That they will sit down and they will write everything and use a calculator to be adding and adding and adding and adding. Distribute all the quotes and everything into different people and all of them will be working and adding and adding and adding. A week or two before they will have the whole thing ready and she could do all of this in one day. Thinking, these people should be happy. Chai, hey, look at this girl. She wants to take job from us. Wait till it happen. Eh, the thing we are doing too, she's coming and doing one day. Our guy will not be thinking we are lazy. We don't know how to do our work. She wants to fire us. It doesn't matter how 
well, you try to seek the approval of men and human beings. You want your self-worth to be compared to them. It will never be enough. But imagine if your self-worth is based on how God sees you and values you. Then your own self-worth, your own self-esteem will grow. And you have confidence to do that which you are doing. And nobody can tell you anything else. It's one of the greatest insults to God and individual could do to call another person useless, a human being useless. One of the greatest sin, in my opinion. Okay? Psychologists will often tell us today, okay? Modern psychologists, that how you think of yourself is a function of how you know the person most important to you thinks of you. I don't know whether that makes sense. Psychology will say, look, if the person I value the most, pride, arrogance, self-importance will disappear. Because he says in his words, I resist the proud and I give grace to the humble. To whom will I listen to? To why will I hear the word? Say so those who have a humble and a contrite spirit. Let me read to you what Madonna wrote in a magazine interview. We all know Madonna, very popular musician of some decades ago. She's still very rich and very bold and brazen. Okay, acted some really brazen movies. Let me read what she what she wrote. Will to push past that fear. She said the moment she crosses that one, it doesn't take long before another one comes up again. And she sees another fear again that she has to deal with. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get to another stage and I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. I find a way to get myself out of that again and again. My drive in life is from this horrible fear of being inadequate and mediocre. It is always pushing me and pushing me. Because even though I have become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended and it probably never will. She's going to fail and end up in frustration if she continues like that. Because she's setting up for herself and comparing herself to what? What she can achieve, what she can attain humanly. And it is what people see and think of her that matters the most. And she therefore works to rise above those limitations so that people can look and think about her and see her as I'm somebody. And now that she's somebody, in the eyes of, obviously, everybody, she's constantly struggling to make sure she remains somebody so that she doesn't become a nobody. Is it possible for you and I should be nobody before God. You know what Christ said in Hebrews 13, 5? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Romans 8, 35 to 39. What shall separate us from the love of God? Mention so many things. Tribulation, famine, sword, peril, blah, blah, blah. Only me and you can separate ourselves from God. Unless we walk away, we choose to walk away. We choose to refuse his admonition, his correction. His love, his guidance. We choose. If we choose, he won't chase us. But even when he chooses, even if we choose and he lets us, even if he throws on the lake of fire and we're burning up, he still loves us. Jesus Christ said, Are you not of much more value than the birds of the air that do not labor, do not do anything, and the lilies of the field, and God clothes them and God feeds them? You are what much more than this. So any sense of inadequacy we may have needs to just vanish. Needs to just vanish. Romans 15 verse 7. Romans 15 verse 7. When Christ becomes the most important person in your life, you will compare.
compare yourself, your achievements, your goals, your shortcomings, your failures, your work to his approval, not society, not the world, not your friends, but God. And make no, make no mistake about this. His standards is, is clear in the scriptures. It's there. We might delude ourselves. I want to go around it, but it's clear and it's glare. And if that is what we're comparing ourselves with our standards, our self-esteem should be really high because he values us beyond anything. So much that his son came and died for us. Christ came and died for us willingly. Proverbs 15, 7 says, Accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. Then God will be glorified. Accept each other as Christ has accepted you. Then you will be glorified. Kindness is love in action. And if we see how God has been kind to us, we might expect and extend such kindness to others as well. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. I'm reading it in the Living Bible paraphrase. It says, in response to all he has done for us, let us outdo each other one translation says, let us be inventive, innovative, in tearing up one another to good works. That's what it says. So let us outdo each other in being helpful and kind to each other and in doing good. I'm looking for the best way I can be kind to you. You're looking for the best way you can be kind to me. We're looking for the best way we can be kind to each other. That is what God does for us. That's what we should do for one another. Conclusion. Brethren, if we have trouble seeing the value and the worth in others, you have trouble being good, being nice to people just for the sake of it. Because they are creatures of God. You have trouble understanding the problems, the issues people are going through. And still, in spite of whatever it is, still go out and be kind and be nice to them. Even if they don't deserve it. Because that's kindness. We'll do good to those who are good to us. That's goodness. That's okay. But kindness is when you are doing good and be nice to those who don't even deserve it. We need to ask God to enrich in us, to give us more and more this ability that is called kindness. It's a fruit of the Spirit, an attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. And as we grow in that, truly our relationships with one another and with God will continue to increase. And it doesn't matter. Remember, it is undeserved kindness. You do me good, I do you good. You do me bad, I do you bad. That's a human concept. People will see a lot of statements online and because it resonates with what they're going through or with their own feeling at the point in time, there's no, no, no standards, no comparison. No way. They just take it and they just repost it and share it. Embedding within their minds things that are anathema or that are opposite to the will of God. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 7, final scripture. You know, if we think God is kind to us now, the way he understands and relates with us and works to improve us, to perfect us, his patience, his long-suffering with us, to improve us, to perfect us, his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace over us, to correct us, to discipline us, to improve us and to perfect us. Read the scriptures to find out how that will be when we are spirit beings in the kingdom of God. It's an everlasting kindness that boggles the mind. Ephesians 2, 7 says that in the ages to come, in the ages to come, that it might show the exceeding riches of his grace 
in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. I'll read it again. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Indeed, eye hasn't seen, and ear has not heard, and the mind of man has not conceived how much God has prepared out of kindness to those who love him. The more we grow and continue to exemplify and exhibit this attribute of the fruit of the Spirit, kindness, the more we are growing to become and attain the nature of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And the better our relationships with one another and with God will be. Sabbath shalom.